Hi, welcome to AmateurLogic.tv, episode 32. I'm George. I'm Jim. And I'm Tommy. And I'm Peter. And we've got, uh, as always, a great and interesting show for you today. <laughs> what are we going to be talking about, Jim? Well, first of all, well, let's talk about coming to you live from the garden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we're at the actually we're at the scene of the accident from field day a few years ago. You may <laughs> recognize the the uh, swimming pool behind us. Peter, is, do they call the backyard in Australia the garden like they do in the UK? Um, yes, but but they also call it the backyard. <laughs> okay, so we're in good standing then. Just checking. <laughs> so we're in the backyard garden. <laughs> oh, what else are we going to talk about? Well. In this episode, we've got some exciting footage from near space. That's right. Near space, too. I actually call it space. It gets black like outer space, but it's not technically outer space. Yeah, it was, that was pretty cool, uh, a pretty cool project. We visited the uh, near space balloon launch from one of the local uh, amateur logic. I'm sorry. And radio clubs at one of the local middle schools. Yeah, it was the uh, Old Town Middle School in Ridgeland, Mississippi. Yeah. Yep. Titans in space is what they're calling this balloon launch. Yeah, you've probably seen, uh, you'll probably recognize some of those guys because we've interviewed them a few times at uh, Jackson Hamfest episodes. Uh, our buddy Bill Richardson, a lot of the kids from the school there. Yeah. Yep. Did a great uh, job. Let me. Uh, and. Uh, Sorry, uh, George. You know, you've actually been up to uh, something yourself. Uh, you've been, you haven't been moonlighting, have you? Well, <laughs> yeah, maybe just a little bit. Uh, I was recently asked by Bob Hall to join him and Gordon West on Ham Nation, a uh, new weekly uh, video podcast that's on the Twit Network. It uh, comes on every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Central live. And you can download the uh, episodes a couple of days later. Uh, it's uh, a great new show. Um, and we want to thank Leo Laporte, who recently became licensed. I didn't bring his call letters with me, so I don't. <laughs> He's applied for a vanity called W6TWT, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, and I highly recommend, while viewers may be able to download Ham Nation, Ham Nation a couple of days after the live uh, uh, take of the show. I highly recommend tuning in live on Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock. It's just a lot more fun. Uh, tune in a little early too because those guys, you get a, get to see a little behind the scenes action before and after the yeah, live Yeah, that's portion. right. It's, it's really interesting. Also, it's pretty cool to, to log in and watch the chat. They've yeah. got an IRC uh, chat room set up. That occurs can, while yeah, the real, filming's going real on. Real time while the filming's going on. It's pretty interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, it's been a lot of fun. They asked me to come on and do a segment called Smoke and Solder where I build a project or do something of that nature uh, every week. And, man, that's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it should be fun, though. So uh, join us every uh, Tuesday night for Ham Nation. The uh, address is twit, that's T-W-I-T dot T-V and click on the live tab on there. You'll need Adobe Flash to, to view that. Uh, if you're using an iOS device, there is actually a Twit app that you can use and uh, view it on uh, the iOS. And if you're gonna download the episode afterwards, it's at www.twit.tv slash hn, like Ham Nation. Well, Jim, have you got an email for us? I do, as a matter of fact. I have an email from Patrick who writes as uh, O-N-7-P-A-T, and he says, Hi, crew! First of all, great job on the vidcast. Thanks, Pat. I have them all downloaded and had lots of fun working my way through them. The photo stuff isn't his favorite. He likes to see more radio stuff, and that's his request, but he says any electronic subject will do nicely. He's an electronics engineer. Keep up the great work, 73s from ON7, P-A-T, Pat, in Flanders, Europe. Thanks, Pat. Tom? Yeah, I certainly do have some. <clears throat> I have one. This one's obviously, obviously uh, a few months old, but uh, it's from our friend Don, K-A-5-D-O-N. Uh, <laughs> no instance with the call sign, huh? Vanity call. Yeah, a lot of vanity yeah. calls out there. 
Uh, anyway, it says it was great meeting you and George at the Jackson Ham Fest yesterday. <laughs> it's been a few months back. Yeah. But anyway, I'm sure you have plenty of topics to cover on future podcasts. Um, but ha- has a suggestion. It says, are you interested in doing a podcast on remote operations? Since you often travel, you could operate from your motel room through the Internet. Um operate a TS-2000. He said he knew I didn't have one yet, and I still haven't gotten one, although it's on the list <laughs> It's on his list, yeah. I think it's on my bucket list. <laughs> it says, anyway, if interested, could loan you one of my remote rig units so you can see how to set it up and test it all out. Wow. There are other units, Glintech, but he only has the remote rig units. And uh, drop me an email, we can make it happen. That's a, a really generous offer to do that, and uh, I would like to take you up on that one however I can get around to Scraping up the funds and getting a TS-2000 getting set up. That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> that was nice. Yeah, thanks, yeah. Tom. And I've got an email here. It comes from Tom into BEW. And Tom writes, after I heard you talk in episode 28, I decided to get on the Cam Radio Net cameras tonight to see if I could see you guys. Uh, he said, so he uh, tuned in to one of the Internet software-defined radio sites. Uh, it was... Uh, sdr-radio.com it's one that Tommy had reviewed in episode 29 and he said that he could uh, hear all of us on there just fine uh, from uh, a radio that was located in Shawnee Oklahoma and he said that you can actually download the uh, SDR receiver software from the website to connect and listen to the radios and uh, he made a recording of it that way, and he sent me a copy of that recording, and uh, I was very impressed with it. I don't know if I've still got it, so we may not be able to play it in this episode. Uh, and he uh, said that uh, someday soon he hopes to get his extra class license, and uh, he'll be checking into the net when he does. Well, yeah. Peter, what are people talking about down under right now? What are we talking about? Probably pretty much the same things that uh, you're talking about over there. Probably the biggest news that I've noticed in, from a technical or tech perspective has been the retirement of the space shuttle uh, this week and um, the very serious questions about what the future is, if any, for the uh, US um, uh, space uh, program. Uh, there's a very heavily heavy reliance at the moment on commercial space providing the next fleet of vehicles. Um, but, uh, you know, it's a bit like uh, when the announcement uh, was made that they were cancelling the shuttle. This is back in about mm, 2004. And uh, they, uh, they announced the Constellation program, but, of course, that went and got cancelled. Now, if uh, commercial space uh, hits a snag um, or, uh, or, or funding gets withdrawn from space, um, you know, uh, we may not see uh, another major space vehicle uh, for the U.S., which would be an absolute travesty. And what about emails? Do you have any emails from down under? Oh, well, certainly there, uh, Jimmy, no problems. I've got one here from Craig, VK3CRG, here in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Craig writes to uh, say that he lives in an apartment and therefore has to operate portable to operate HF. He has a Buddy Pole Deluxe and has managed to work stations all over the world using his Kenwood TS590, which he describes as his beautiful new radio. He's also chatted many times on the W5PPB Sharon Echolink repeater, but has yet to get hold of George, Tommy or Jimmy. Last Christmas Day, Craig uh, had a nice long chat with Bill, N5YCK, who starred in our last video. Uh, he finishes, keep up the great work, guys, with uh, Amatologic73 from Melbourne, Australia. Well, thanks, Craig. Um, on the subject of operating out of an apartment, there's a chap who, there is a chap called uh, Peter, uh, VK3YE, who I know that you know, and uh, he's actually, uh, he's, he's built a number of loop antennas, uh, which can work quite well in, uh, in uh, they're quite compact and can, can work quite well in apartments, and uh, I was looking at his website tonight, and he was saying that he was able to work uh, Western Australia and New Zealand uh, just using a, uh, a loop antenna, so that might be an option you might want to consider. Very good, thanks Peter. And I've got one here from John, W-A-8-Y-X-M, who writes about the 70 centimeter band. And he says, you know, there's a threat to the 70 centimeter band. And he'd like to remind amateurs that this is more serious than one might think. 
Many hams use 70 centimeters, John says, to control a remote base, and it's often used to remote uh, to receivers or to a transmitter on a two meter repeater. Also, he says in episode 30, you expressed a question, can hyperterminal be used on a TNC? And the short answer is any terminal will do, including hyperterminal, though some are easier than others. Thanks, John. And you're absolutely right. There is a serious threat to the 70 centimeter band. George is a little more up on that than I am, I know. And uh, so is there anything you'd like to add on that topic, George? Uh, basically, uh, just uh, maybe go on QRZ and do a little search for 70 centimeters, and you'll find uh, some links on there uh, in some of the posts that uh, talk about where you can go to complain about this. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I'd suggest that uh, maybe, maybe you take a look at that. Yeah, that's good advice. <clears throat> I've got one here from a uh, friend, Jim. He says, in episode 26, I had a great segment on creating time-lapse videos. I was wondering what Windows software you use to do the screen capture. Um, so also, he says, he started studying for his uh, technician license. I feel that I'm ready. Uh, if I feel I'm ready, I plan to sit for my license at the Huntsville Ham Fest in August. He'll also try to send some photos and video from the Ham Fest. So that sounds great. Oh, yeah. That's cool. And uh, actually, I'm planning on going to that Ham Fest, too, so maybe I'll see you there. Yeah, uh, got tentative plans. And as far as the, the screen capture, I think I used uh, an old version of Camtasia before it became a commercial product. I remember that. Okay. Camtasia. And uh, but you had found another screen capture program that uh, actually worked better. You remember the name of it? Cam Studio, uh, I believe, was the name of it. That's the one that yep. uh, I was using under Windows XP. Under uh, Windows Seven, I found another one that I, I really like. It's uh, Blueberry Software. I don't remember the name of the Yeah, the that's program. the one I was trying to think of. Yeah. I played with that. Uh, I've been doing everything mostly on the Mac, and it used QuickTime for that lately, but uh, I did play with that. It was very nice. So if you look up Blueberry Software, you should run into it. Yeah, and good luck on your exam, uh, Jim. We'll, we're sure you'll make it. Oh, yeah. I've got an email here that comes from Ed, KD5DPK. And it says he's got a question for an upcoming episode. Uh, I've got several digital multimeters, and I'm not sure how to properly use them. There are a lot of different settings and connections. He says, I have a Fluke 27 FM meter and a Micronta 22185, which is a Radio Shack meter. He said, anything you could show in the future would be great. And, and that's something that I've thought about doing before. Actually, I think I, I may have actually started on it a couple of years ago and didn't really uh, finish it. So, uh, excellent idea, Ed, and that's something I do plan to cover here on Amateur Logic or, or maybe on Ham Nation, one or the other, but we'll let you know when that becomes available. Uh, Peter, have you got another email? Certainly, no worries. I've got an email here from Dylan, uh, who's not an amateur yet, but hi Peter, it was by accident I found the show and ham radio has always intrigued me, but I've never taken the plunge. Is it possible a segment could be done on taking those first delicate steps into the world of ham radio, including some cheap uh, equipment recommendations? I'm an Aussie also, so anything relevant to me would be much appreciated. I'm a system administrator and Linux user, I think that'll please Jimmy. So I'll be sure to pass on any information I find about Linux alternatives to the applications you use. Congrats to everyone on a great show. As a younger person, age 31, I feel like everyone my age is missing out by passing on stuff like this for their Xbox, etc. I have... Uh Watched every show in the space of a week and enjoyed them all immensely. Uh, credit to all involved in their creation. Cheers, Dylan. Well, excellent news there, Dylan. Um, there's a problem with doing um, the kind of segment that you're talking about, about the, taking those first steps in amateur radio, because the regulations and the, the tests that you do in each uh, country will vary from country to country. So we could do one, for example, on the foundation a license here in Australia, but it wouldn't have any relevance to people in the US. Uh, so that could be problematic. However, um, I can tell you that uh, here in Australia we have a uh, an entry-level uh, classification uh, of for license or an entry-level license called the foundation license. It's recently 
recently introduced you can get it in a weekend it's that easy and it gives real privileges on HF and above that you can use to uh, actually go and uh, have a, a, some real experience with ham radio and so I'd encourage you and uh, anybody else who's uh, interested in uh, getting their ham radio license to uh, uh, look up uh, a look around for their local ham radio club perhaps uh, you might want to go to wia.org.au uh, and have a look there they uh, they probably have the clubs listed somewhere on that website and uh, contact your local club and uh, you'll find that uh, they'll probably be more than help uh, more than happy to steer you in the direction of uh, um, getting you started in ham radio uh, give you some equipment recommendations and possibly uh, they'll possibly run uh, the examinations uh, in your area as well that's a uh, great information Peter in the United States you might want to check out ARRL.org right speaking of new technicians you're about to see some in our segment entitled Titans in Space because we had several new technicians come into the hobby as a result of this balloon launch and so without any further ado here you are from the Titans in Space Balloon Launch. I'm here with Science Payload Coordinator, Bobby. Hello, how are you doing this morning? Fine, and how are you? I'm doing outstanding. It looks like uh, the weather is going to cooperate this morning. I believe it is. I believe it's going to cooperate just nicely. So tell us a little bit about the balloon launch in general, and then more specifically about the science payload. Okay. Well, the balloon is going to go up to about 95,000 feet. Uh, we have teams set up all across the state and in Alabama to help us recover this, uh, this payload. Our payload has about uh, nine experiments on board, which uh, the students themselves came up with. They researched them. They designed the tests. We've been working months on collecting data. We have seeds that have been donated by NASA. They've already been on the space shuttle, but have not have been subjected to the extremes of space. And now we're going to subject them to extremes of space. And we will test them by bringing them back, growing them, and see against a control group what they will do. We have batteries on board. We're going to be testing them. We have popcorns. Uh, Mr. Uh, Sheridan here put popcorns on board and wants to see if they pop. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me interrupt you right there and uh, introduce your team members here. I'm Sheridan. Sheridan? Sheridan. Okay, Sheridan. And who else you got? Vadisha. And? I'm Shelby. Oh, okay. Hey. Uh, you guys have done an outstanding job, it looks like, and uh, boy, the interest that we've seen here is uh, tremendous. Did you did you ever think you'd have this many people show up? No, sir. <laughs> did you uh, think more like uh, this was just going to be just you and your schoolmates? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Sheridan, is it? Shelby. Shelby, I'm sorry. Sheridan, <laughs> Shelby. Shelby, uh, uh Tell us about the, a little bit more about the experiment that you, or were you working with the seeds? Um, we were kind of all working with everything. Well, the seeds are, are like you said, donated to us by NASA, and we're going to send them up and bring them back down and plant them. And then there's other stuff like the popcorn. We're going to see if it, the like conditions in space make it pop and other fun stuff like that. So. <laughs> all right. Yeah, uh, speaking of which, uh, Bobby, uh, I heard you mention 95,000 feet. That's actually in outer space, isn't it? Well, it's near space. It's not quite exactly in space. We're still inside of the atmosphere, but we're attempting to go as far as possible before our balloon pops and then drops back with a parachute. And I'm sure our viewers can hear the wind blowing across our microphone because uh, I forgot, number one, to bring the <laughs> windshield this morning. But tell us this. Uh, I, I was looking at uh, both the winds here on the ground 
and the winds aloft forecast. A lot of people may not realize that the winds way up in the sky are very different from here on the ground. Are, are either one of those going to interfere with your launch today, or how will they affect the balloon? Well, due to our current weather conditions, it's going to fly pretty much due east. Uh, it's probably going to travel about 60 to 70 miles per hour uh, once it gets uh, pretty far up into the atmosphere. Um, thank goodness the jet stream has moved north, or it would be traveling closer to 150 miles per hour, uh, which could put our balloon in the Atlantic. So we're glad that the jet stream has moved north. It's going to push it a little bit past Meridian, and hopefully we won't affect the air show over there today. Oh, wow, that is tremendous. Okay, back to the payload. Um, uh, can you tell us, uh, you've told us about the seeds and the other things on board. What about the instrumentation that you have in there? Because I've seen a lot this morning. Well, the instrumentation uh, that we have, we have a, a beacon that's going to send out a signal that is a repeating beacon every every 60 seconds to allow other people to track it. We have a GPS coordinator, uh, which is going to send out a signal that we can track via uh, satellite. NASA is actually going to help us, uh, assist us in tracking this as well. And we have, again, several teams that uh, we have already told them in advance where this is potentially going to uh, to land. So they will be listening for those signals, and they have directional finders that they will go and be able to assist us in recovery. Wow, fantastic. Bill, tell us once again what this is. This is a, it's a spot locator device. Uh, I believe it's findmespot.com. It's a, it's a unit that's independent of the two ham radio tracking devices that we're using. It's, uh, uses regular GPS. It sends up uh, every 10 minutes. Uh, GPS, longitude, latitude, altitude, to a satellite and it relays it to the internet and it's hopefully we'll be able to make it public because it's kind of a private site so we'll we'll do that shortly but this is our third redundant system so we got three redundancies APRS, HF telemetry and this all sending the same thing so let's hope it works. Jim and Tom are on site this morning. Uh, I'm also watching the Ustream feed here, so since I'm not on site, at least I can see some of what's going on. The uh, frame rate on the screen is kind of low, but it is still visible, and uh, it gives me a good idea of what's going on there. You can probably hear them talking in the background. I ran across uh, our cohort and crimes uh, neighbor, uh, Alex. Um, Alex, how long have you been working on this project? It's been like since before Christmas. It's been a um, really long time, probably about five months. Really? Yeah. It's pretty exciting, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. I understand you just got your license too? Yes, I did. Yeah. Uh, how long ago? It was in. It was back in January. January. What's your call sign? KF5JGE. KF5JGE. Well, congratulations on getting your license. It's nice talking to you. They're probably already either on their way to Meridian or over there. Uh, we've got one coming from South Mississippi, possibly one coming from Birmingham, Alabama. So there's about five, six teams already going out and positioning. It's supposed to land near Livingston, Alabama. This is kind of, I'm not going to say it's groundbreaking, but it may be. This is HF telemetry. This is going around the world when it goes. Um, literally, it could go to Europe, Australia, wherever. This sends out longitude, latitude, altitude, temperature, satellite condition, all kinds of stuff. And uh, the frequency is 14.079 plus 1500 on the waterfall to decode the digital stuff. Uh, there's four modes. There's Domino X16, Ridi 110, then the CW and the Hellschreiber only show the altitude, the, the ready and the other is full telemetry. Um, now part of the whole deal was this, is I met up with Frank Howell, or Fra Frank's in the back. He uh, saw our project at the Jackson Ham Fest and we talked for about an hour and you know he hooked me up with Mississippi State, then the Bagley uh, College of Engineering and Victor here, we all got together and one of the things that Mississippi State uh, wanted us to do and we wanted to do for them is make sure that they're represented on this so 
this telemetry module, what we're going to do here is very quickly, we're going to cut out very quickly another white piece after I duct tape everything up. Um, a logo's got to go on here. It's going to be the Mississippi State logo. I'm not sure if it is it the Bagley logo or is it uh Okay. So, so it's it's going to go on here on this telemetry module. It's big enough where we can all see. So I want to thank Mississippi State. Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't have done it without them. It was crucial. Good job, man. It was crucial to get them involved. And this is not a one-time deal. We're hoping this is the beginning of a partnership between our school, Old Town Middle School, and Mississippi State. So I'm just glad they're on board and glad Frank and I met. And uh, hope this is all great for everybody. Thank y'all. Thank everybody for coming. We're getting real close. I just got to do a little bit of this and tape it, and we'll we'll launch. So it's fixing to get kind of rocking and rolling. All right. And you know these kids. I don't know if I've introduced everybody. Y'all may have. This is a. There's kids here. I don't even know. <laughs> I see them in the hallway, but I'm usually pointing fingers at them. It's my radio club. It's Old Town Middle School Radio and Technology Club. Is the balloon portion of it? We're doing the telemetry and all that. The science team, which is Mr. Robinson and a few of his crew, uh, they're in the back. They've designed science experiments, um, gone through a lot of testing procedures, and you'll see down on the payload in the end when y'all get a chance. They've got payloads and all. So this has been a group effort for about the past two months, three months maybe. But this whole thing started over a year ago, and I've had to plan for almost a year to get the training through the ARRL Teacher Institute and all this sort of stuff. So thanks to the ARRL, thanks to JARC, Mississippi State, Old Town, the people here, Mr. Robinson's science crew, all my kids. Thank y'all for all this. Now let's get down to business and get this thing in the air. All right. All right. 1.54 pounds. 1.54 pounds for the sheet. Okay, you can take it out. Now, here's what we're going to do. Okay. We'll put it right here. The bucket, it's already been zeroed with the bucket on. All right. Somebody grab a scale. All right. Set it. Set it. All right, guys. I need extra hands, probably. All right, lay in that piece first. <laughs> Lay in that piece. Lay, in. Lay, in. Lay that in. You need to stand. Very carefully. Very carefully. Three point eight one pounds. How much? Three point eight one. Okay. Woo. All right, now walk it back out. They've got the balloon outside now and they are ready to launch. Uh, so far, I'm assuming that all the radios are on. However, uh, I haven't received a signal yet on the uh, packet and I don't see anything in the waterfall in FL Digi. Um, for the 20 meter telemetry modes. So apparently they're not high enough that I can hear them from here yet. Okay. Right, where's the end of the line? Ah! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
I was looking this morning at the winds of law forecast and at 39,000 feet the winds were 95 miles an hour now the balloons going up to 95,000 feet so it will certainly be subjected to those hundred mile per hour winds and I don't know that's as that's as high as the winds of law forecast I got estimated it was 39,000 feet so uh, I, I don't know if the wind speed goes down as, as it continues up or what but the other interesting thing was the extreme temperatures at uh, 39,000 feet the temperature this morning is minus 142 degrees Fahrenheit obviously it'll be even colder the higher it goes toward 95,000 feet so It'll definitely be a right, test and a challenge for the equipment. We're going to do a crowd countdown. Are we ready? Because it's calm. Are we ready? Yeah. yeah. All right, I'll start it and y'all go. Ready? Ready? Guys, let it, just let it go. Five, <laughs> four, three, two, one, go. Okay, the balloon has been launched, and they're sitting there watching it now, and this is probably Tommy. Hello, Tommy. Yeah, I, I saw him launch it from here. So, uh, did y'all take the launch? Cool. All right. Okay. address listed on QRZ.com. My name is Fatima 73. This is KC5 NXD Sierra Charlie 5 November X-ray Delta. And there was a voice speaking. It was almost full scale on me here. So I'm going to switch over to the APRS frequency now and see if we're copying the signal there yet. We're beginning to, to see a little bit of data here on uh, FL Digi in the ready mode. Not quite enough that we're popping in here yet. But we do see the signals down in the waterfall. And we think that's probably the balloon. Well, it's been gone about maybe, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, and it's gone, it looks like a good 30 miles or so by now. I'm tracking it on my iPhone on uh, Open APRS. And uh, it's going, they're wanting it to go pretty much to the east, but it's got a little bit of curvature to the north, so unless it turns back south a little bit, I don't think it's going to make it to Livingston. It's above uh, almost a Highway 43 at the Wildlife Refuge over uh, near the Natchez Trace and Highway 43. I would guess that's probably 20, 25 miles maybe. It's a nice little ride up there, could be 30. Yeah, it's, yeah, oh yeah, it's looking. I wish I could show you the screen on here. But, uh, we'll go back to George in the studio and get that shot. Okay. Now, I just heard the 20 meter beacon go off in the background there. It did not have enough time up for you to hear it. But uh, we'll try to catch that when it comes back around. I assume that they're going to be uh, cycling through the four data modes here. So I don't really know what to expect uh, as far as what we'll see on 20 meters. And it looks like right now the balloon is traveling almost 38 miles per hour. 90 degrees east and it's at 10,000 feet. And here comes the uh, domino. KC5 NXD and all the pertinent data that follows showing the altitude, uh, some of the various things. Let's try to break that down and uh, see what we've got here. First a call sign, then a sequence number, and 
within the hour, minute, and second. And that is correct. It was uh, 1600 when that packet came in. Uh, following that is the latitude and the longitude. And the altitude uh, that doesn't look just right to me. Let's start at the back end. Let's change modes now and go over and uh, watch it on ready. See if we're receiving that yet. We'll quickly uh, take a look down here. At a package screen, and there is the last transmission we received there. Well, mysteriously, the uh, 20 meters just all of a sudden got better about uh, nine minutes after 11. You can hear it blasting in there now. That was a domino uh, transmission right there. Really good signals on it now, so I, maybe it just wasn't on yet uh, when I was trying earlier, but uh, very good uh, 20 meter signals here now. Couldn't ask for any better. So now let's get the latest reading here. It is steady going up. All right, now it says uh, 17,096. And that's uh, 56,089. Let's go over here and look at the TNC again. 56,728. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All the instruments tracking. are reporting the same thing. Man. Now, one thing that's a little confusing, this looks like 5.4 volts mm -hmm. um, right here uh, coming on APRS. I, I would assume that's what that means. Mm -hmm. Uh, if we look at FL Digi, it's saying 8.56, so don't know what that's about. Yeah, maybe it's two different batteries. I don't, I don't know. What is that mode then? Uh, this mode is Domino uh, EX16 right here. Yeah. Uh, the first uh, segment here is a call sign, then a sequence number. And then the hours in UTC, and looking at my UTC clock, that's about right. Uh, follow that, the latitude, the longitude, um, the altitude, and then SATS, I'm not sure what SAT is, S-A-T-S, and then the battery voltage. And then the, yep, the temperature. Down to minus 180 degrees. Yep. And just, uh, oh wow, it just went across the Union, man. It'd be in Alabama here in a minute. Delete that other one, George. <clears throat> yeah, I found a previous flight. Yeah, oh, there it is. Oh, look at that, man. Get some screenshots of that, George. 39 miles an hour. It slowed down then. Oh, yeah. So that means it has exited the top of the jet stream's influence. So it didn't show me the altitude that time. Every once in a while, the altitude that come back. I understand. There it is. There it is. Little over Union, Mississippi. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it has. Apparently, it's slowed down now. Uh, let's see. My uh, okay. 60, 61,000 feet. 61,000. So the doggone jet yeah. stream was nearly uh, 20,000 feet deep. On uh, 20 meters here, the digital, well, we're looking at uh, domino mode. It's showing it in meters, 18,741. But meters. if you look over in the packet, it's showing it uh, in feet. In, in feet. Okay. 62,316. Yeah, and it's showing like 5.2 volts here mm -hmm. on uh, so packet. But if you look over here, it's it's 8.5. Uh -huh. Minus 200 
degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah. yeah no. So you're copying that packet direct. Yeah. Oh, oh, all of this I'm copying. Yeah. What's your no, the packet I'm getting is uh, off two meters. VHF. So uh, he's just due south of Philadelphia. Yeah, he's over here in That's a chunky tough road. At a 69,337. Now, it pretty, I mean, you know, he's on his way to 95,000. Look. 1124. Oh, that's Hellscriber, huh? Yeah. And it's supposed to be the altitude, so I guess we missed part of it's the It's kind altitude. of like wheat packs. 21,300. 21,776. That's the height. Okay. Yeah. So that's 21,776. We've, we've received all the modes of them now. Yep. Zoom on out. Yeah. There's where it started at the, uh, was that the craft center or what was that place called? That's, that's uh, Madison, Madison, okay. uh, Madison Avenue. Yeah. Madison Career and something center. But yeah, it's the location where it's going to be I guess. That's from somebody next door to us. So that's twenty one forty four something. Twenty one thousand four hundred and forty seven meters. What time is it? Eight forty nine, so it's uh the Pacific time. So it was forty seven. Oh, oh yeah. So it's been in the air for an hour now. I have to add three hours to that, eight forty seven and nine. That would be right. Ten forty seven. Yeah. So this is how far we've gone. In an hour. And most of that, uh, maybe I won't say most of it, but a lot of it was due to the eastbound jet stream. Mm -hmm. But it's come and out they, of that now. Yeah, and they were predicting uh, Livingston. Uh huh. So there's Livingston over it's here. It's headed straight for it, isn't it? It's uh, off the map. You know, they have that there. prediction software that they run, and it takes all the winds aloft into account. 22,778. Yep. It's the last hell uh, Currently That's still right. in Mississippi. Um, go past Union to the east. It's at uh, 65,000 feet, so it's dropping. It is dropping, but not fast, so I'm not sure exactly what's going on with that. I have lost the ARPS data coming in on two meters. Uh, I still have a pretty decent copy, though, on the uh, 20 meter data.
That was a lot of fun. Tell me, how, how far did that balloon travel? I believe that thing went 111 miles, if I remember right. That's pretty impressive. And how far did we track it, George? Uh, we tracked it a, uh, approximately 97 miles, so not bad. Yeah, not bad. You, you, you figure it's got to go out of line of sight at some point on its way down. Yeah. It was, it was a very impressive It was project. really fun. We, we all agreed that we wish we were involved earlier in the process so that we could have brought you more and better coverage, and so maybe next time we will be. Yeah, I'd like to go by and, and uh, get some of uh, the project preparation. They had quite a few projects on there, as you saw, and uh, they're actually compiling a DVD. And uh, aren't they selling it to try yeah. to raise funds for the next, uh, the next launch? I think so. We'll try to include that link in the show notes. Well, what else you got? Well, I've got on my notes here that it's time for Jim to read an email. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thinking back to uh, Peter's last statement about uh, me liking Linux and ham radio, you're right, Peter. I do. And so apparently does K, K8GZ. K writes, thank you, George, Tommy, Jimmy, and Peter. I certainly enjoy your shows. It's, uh, I know it's a chore to find material and time to produce an episode and I find them very interesting, even though I've been a licensed ham for over 50 years. I'm amazed at how many projects you folks complete. And he says he doesn't guess they get much done up north because he's trying to stay warm. It got down to minus 8 degrees Fahrenheit last night, and he had to crank the Variac transformer up on the iron to melt solder. He probably wouldn't appreciate your, uh, your movement there to try to get field day moved to December. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> October. I just want October. So uh, anyway, he says, tell Jimmy, or, or she, I'm not sure which, tell Jimmy if he wants to do a segment on why you should use a Linux OS, I'll be watching. And he says he'll watch even if it's why you should not use a Linux OS. Many thanks for your AmateurLogic.tv productions. They deserve to be in the National Archives. Thank you, Kay. <laughs> well, uh, I do highly recommend Linux as a ham radio OS. They probably have more uh, per OS, more ham radio related programs than any other OS, believe it or not. And I am reticent and not having a segment on how to do ham radio with a Linux OS. So we will try to get that on sometime in the near future, hopefully. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, I've got a question. Uh, sorry, if I may. Uh, J Jimmy, I've got a question for you on that subject. Certainly. Um, in your opinion, yes. is Linux sufficiently refined now enough to be a practical alternative to Windows if somebody wants to have an operating system and be able to uh, you know, check their email, surf the web, just do basic, basic everyday tasks um, on That's their an computer? That's an excellent question, Peter, because in the past, Linux has been more of a hobbyist or enthusiast or tinkerer's operating system. It was rough around the edges and not always user-friendly or as user-friendly as some might expect. Now it, it is much more refined. It does still have uh, a wart here and there and something that might trip up some users. But for the most part, I would say yes. The answer to your question is it is sufficiently refined. If you stick with some mm -hmm. of the mainstream distros too, like uh, OpenSUSE, right. and keep the stable releases, Ubuntu. then you, you're yeah Ubuntu. That's a very good one also. Yep. You're pretty safe. You yes. shouldn't run into many problems at all, if any. Yeah. And like uh, uh, Jimmy, one final question: uh, of the various distributions available, and there are a, a, a Linux does does of course come in a, a whole range of different flavors and styles. Uh, which distribution would you recommend for a beginner? Currently, I'm using Ubuntu, and it is really slick, highly polished, and I would recommend that one for a starter. There are some others, as Tommy mentioned, SUSE, uh, perhaps uh, Fedora, and there are some others. A little surfing around will get you probably what you're interested in. Yeah, I'm a big, I'm a fan of the Open SUSE distro myself. It's uh pretty well no-brainer the installer is so easy yeah pretty much everything's in there pretty complete George um actually actually I've got an email oh okay jump ahead is here. that an email or, or what is that it's actually a Twitter post 
Twitter post. Yeah, it? it's actually from our buddy Eddie, uh, N4EMP. He had oh. some trouble with his rig. I think we mentioned that previously, and uh, he was giving us a follow-up. said he appreciates the mention of his ICOM issue in the latest video, which I think it was actually a couple back. But he said it turned out being a factory issue where they installed a wrong value resistor caused a power output transistor failure, but all seems to be good on the wattage output now. He made several QSO contacts uh, on uh, BPSK31, but he's not really driving it hard to make it last longer. But he still thinks he'd like a Kenwood TS2000 also. <laughs> Apparently that's very popular. I guess you can put it on your bucket list too, Eddie. I got one on mine. I'm gonna get one one of these days. George is making that TS2000 popular. Yeah, he ought to get some advertising revenue. Well, Tommy, who would you actually follow to get those Twitter posts that we're talking about? Follow Amateur Logic on Twitter, and uh, I usually keep those. Uh, try to keep that account active. Um, post on there quite often usually put some interesting things on there at least I hope they're interesting so give us a check out and our Facebook page right George yeah we, we don't have any uh, Facebook post to read this episode because we're so backed up on the emails right now but I want to encourage you to go there but we've got 530 members now we're shooting 4,000 before the year's out yeah yeah we need to have a celebration when we hit a thousand we do Pretty cool Shooting celebration episode. Yeah. There's a lot of interesting posts on there from our uh, different group members, as as well as posts from us on uh, what we're into and what's going on, and a little bit of comedy, too. Yeah, Tommy Sinatra stopped by there the yeah. other day after his trip to Vegas. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, Thanks, must little have, brother. that must have been some trip to Vegas, man, because I promise I really don't remember a bit of that <laughs> stuff happening, but apparently it did. It's there, all there in black and white. <laughs> but there is a lot of participation on our Facebook page, and you might enjoy it. You should really check it out. Well, yeah. Peter, have you got another uh, email for us and maybe a lead into your segment? Uh, certainly. Uh, well, my last email here is uh, from Robert. Uh, hi, Peter. My name's Robert. What a coincidence. Uh, and I've been licensed for five years. Robert spends a lot of time reading amateur radio magazines, uh, both UK and American. He asked if we could do a swap of some radio magazines. Uh, Robert is two whiskey Oscar... Bravo, Juliet, Romeo, and he's in Swansea in the UK. Uh, well, I've got plenty of reading material here, um, Robert, but uh, I had a hunt around and I've actually found some amateur radio magazines and they're put out by the Wireless Institute of Australia. And seeing as you've given me your, uh, uh, your address, uh, I'll be happy to send those to you. And uh, as for my segment, uh, well, there's no real linkage from that email into the segment, but uh, as you know, we're all podcasters here, and uh, most of the time we, we spend our time uh, ad-libbing, as I am right at this very moment. However, uh, if you can actually use a teleprompter or an auto cue, it can actually make, be, uh, make things a lot more professional and a lot more smooth flowing. So uh, with a, a little bit of help from some uh, material or some tips that I saw uh, on uh, uh, Jerry El Ellsworth's uh, website, uh, I've actually put this segment together and I've built my own auto cue. Hello everyone, today I'd like to show you my Flytouch 3 Android based tablet. Now to cut a long story short, uh, I don't recommend it. You're far better off looking at something like a Samsung Galaxy Tab or an Apple iPad. Uh, the firmware in these and other similar tablets from Shenzhen in China doesn't work very cleanly and often things don't work very well. However, if by chance you have actually purchased one of these, or have a similar tablet that can run Android, I'd like to show you a practical use for it. This is my homemade teleprompter. We'll start at the bottom 
where I've got a piece of metal folded over onto itself and a hole for my tripod mount. A nut goes on the other side to hold the, the assembly to the tripod. Pine base, a couple of pieces of pine here and here. A4 picture frame with the glass glued on the edges to the picture frame. Car window tint on this side of the glass and you can get instructions on how to apply car window tint off the internet. At the back goes my camera. I got this G-clamp off the internet which holds my camera in place and as you can see the camera shoots through the pane of glass. The two pieces of wood here are so that you can drape a towel or a cloth over the whole assembly to minimize glare and reflection. On this side the subject looks through the pane of glass at the video camera when it's running. We've got our tablet here running Easy Prompter and it's in reverse and the text is scrolling and we very carefully put that in place and now we look, we look through the glass at the video camera and read out what is uh, scrolling in front of us uh, and from the video camera's perspective all it can actually see is you so it films you reading out what you've put down in your script a, a simple practical and easy way to uh, make a teleprompter using an old Android tablet. Uh, if you've got an Apple iPad or a tablet that runs on some other systems, there are other teleprompter programs out there that you can use to build a similar assembly. <laughs> Great job, Peter. You know, uh, I tried to build, well, I actually did build a teleprompter a few years back, and I think Tommy and I used it on maybe one episode. We did. Uh, yep, yeah, one way back in the beginning. Yeah. I don't know why we haven't used it since. Probably because we're, uh, we're ad-libbers. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you get yep. all the mistakes. Yeah. It was a great segment, though, Peter, and a great-looking teleprompter. And I think that's something I could do. It looked, uh, looked like I could pull that off. Well, I've already, uh, I've already demolished the first one and actually built version 2, which is a bit smaller and a little bit lighter. The biggest problem I found, particularly with the, these cheaper tripods, is that um, you know the, the, uh, they do an auto cue can actually weigh quite a bit, so I actually used some lighter materials and uh, made it a little bit smaller uh, so that uh, it, it didn't uh, put so much weight on the tripod. I've got one more thing I'd like to mention here. You know, Amateur Logic is uh, an edited podcast. Uh, we spend a good bit of time individually producing segments and bringing them to you. But there are a couple of uh, live ham radio programs out there that you might want to watch on the internet. And one is my uh, good friend Tom, KB4HQA, who's over near Atlanta. And Tom has a, a website you can go to. It's uh, hqaradio.com. He has a show every Sunday. Uh, I believe it's at 8 p.m. Central Time. And... Uh, Drop in and check out Tom and see what he's talking about every week. He has guests on there. I've I've been on it uh, at least once, I think. I don't think, I think I've been so. on it twice. Yeah. Is that available on iTunes? I don't know. Uh, uh, his is streamed live, and, and okay. I'm not sure that he puts every episode as a download. And, of course, uh, check out Ham Nation at uh, twit.tv every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Central with Bob Heil, Gordon West, and myself. Uh, you know, I'm the new guy there, so uh, there we'll just go. have to see how it goes. There you go. Oh, it's going well. Yes, that's great. I'm glad to see another show come out. Yeah. Well, have any of you guys got anything else we need to mention before we close the show? No, that's all the emails I have. Well, yeah. Go ahead, Peter. Well, I've got a couple of tidbits. First is a, um, a little bit of news regarding Arisat 1. Uh, now that's actually a small micro satellite, about 10 centimeters by 10 centimeters, and it's uh, it's going to uh, launch and send out telemetry and slow scan television uh, on the two meter uh, band, both in FM and in analog. So you'll be able to receive that uh, hopefully in the near future, and uh, it's due to be launched probably in the next week. 
uh, and it's going to be launched uh, during a spacewalk from the International Space Station. Uh, I believe there's going to be some tests done uh, over the next couple of days before it's actually uh, launched. So that's the first thing. The other thing, and I'm going to be a bit self-indulgent here, is a quick show and tell. Uh, you probably recognise this. This is an old drive-in speaker from, many, from years gone by. And uh, I'm a huge, huge, huge drive-in fanatic. And uh, what I did was I got uh, one of these. This is a cushion radio. Quite, uh, quite cute, isn't it? Uh, and it's basically uh, an FM radio which is operated by a series of push buttons on the front here of this, uh, of this uh, uh, radio. So if I go, let's say, on... Oh, you can, there is where the, the, the trouble... You see, I can turn it on. Anyway, what I did was I ripped the insides of this out and I've installed it in a drive-in speaker and put a series of small switches down the side. So now, when I go to my local drive-in theatre, and the, uh, these days the sound comes through my FM radio, I just hang this on my uh, car window, and my FM sound comes through the, um, the, uh, the, the speaker. Very quiche, very uh, old-fashioned. Very retro, yeah. as we yeah. would say yeah. here in America. Get the whole nostalgic effect. That's pretty cool. That's pretty sharp, Peter. Yep. Well, it's, no pretty, it's pretty hot out here, guys. I think we need to wrap it up. Okay, yeah. well. Should we go fall in the pool? Yeah. yeah. Let's yeah. go. <laughs> tie, tie this bow on it then and we'll say 7-3. Yeah, hope you've enjoyed it. Yeah, we'll see you next time. Yeah, we'll catch you next time. Later, Peter. 73s. My Tom friend. <laughs> Let me do that again. Your Tom friend. My Tom friend. <laughs> my other Tom friend. <laughs> oh.